a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yes, we are going to talk about Star Wars. My guest is Gary Wayne. Very happy to have him here. A while ago, we did the Chronicles of Narnia. And this time, we decided to uh, analyze Star Wars and the occult meaning of that. So, Gary, welcome back to the show. Happy to have you here. And you have good news for us. I do. I have uh, my book two out uh, for pre-order. Uh, it's scheduled for a release for March 12th, but we expect we'll have production sooner. It's just a matter of being cautious for the industry because you can't miss the release date. So we're hoping to beat that. So it's up on um, for pre-order at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, BarnesandNoble.com, most online bookstores. I understand from some of my followers that it's online in Australia with Amazon, so probably in England, probably parts of Europe as well. So, And I also have pre-order availability for signed copies uh, on my website. Uh, Kindle edition isn't available yet, although Amazon can make that available anytime they want because they have the digital version at this point. It's just a matter of when they want to do that. So... Uh, hoping, hopefully they'll do that sooner than later. And so on my website as well, I have the ability to get a signed copy. And also uh, there's a generous excerpt of all 84 chapters up on my website um, versus the 98 chapters of the first book. So it's a little bit shorter. I, I only promised it would be a little bit shorter. And this, one is, this one is specifically targeted at Christians. And mm -hmm. uh, it goes deeper into the Bible on subjects like giants, hybrid giants, uh, angels, the angelic order, the rebellious ones, how that connects into the gods and the assembly of the gods or the assembly of the gods in the Bible. They're all talking about the same thing. And while I'm doing that in the first sort of two thirds of the book is I'm highlighting key words and information that is really important for understanding end time prophecy so as i get into the last couple of sections of the book then i start laying down uh, a chronology for end time prophecy and i'm using those terms that we've talked about in providing larger context as to what we can expect the closer we get to the last seven years and you know, I think we're in, and I speculate that we're in the fig tree generation, but, you know, we could be a ways away, but things continue to sort of ramp up. So, yeah, very, uh, it's this one, as I said, is targeted at Christians. I said I would never do a sequel. Uh, and I, and I've, you know, I stopped a book I was in 300 pages into to write the sequel, but I was kind of struggling in format and where I wanted to go with it. So, it wasn't hard to sort of leave that project and start this once I understood that there's this tremendous thirst out there by Christians. They're not taught prehistory or prophecy in the Bible. There's so much misinformation out there. So what I try and do is give them all of the sourcing that they need, and it's on the same page. So there are footnotes, not endnotes. And you can, everybody can check my veracity and my sources and the meanings of the words. And I take think most of the words, the important words back to Greek in the New Testament and Hebrew in the Old Testament. So you get the true definitions from the original Strong's Dictionary in English from the 1850s, which is the larger definition and really, really important for that. So, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to it. It's off to a strong start on, on, on pre-orders. And uh, then, you know, I've got a new energy for the new book. I've started it. I can see the path. So I'm sort of rewriting the first couple hundred pages and we'll go from there. And it will be shorter than both of these books. That's the only thing I'm going to guarantee. So it might be 82 chapters or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I'm very happy and uh, I can't wait to uh, hold it in my hands. I have to order it as well. Definitely. Thank you. Appreciate it. So um, before we dive into our Star Wars subject, there is something that I would like to address because I value your point of view. And I saw something that I found really disturbing, to put it mildly. 
And uh, it was the following. Since we have this conflict with uh, Israel and Hamas, uh, the emo emotions are boiling on both sides of the aisle. And uh, things are being said that, uh, from both parties that make my skin crawl. And um, I saw a pastor, I had never heard of him uh, before. His name is Chris Locke. I, I don't know if you're familiar with him. And uh, I, I wanted to pull it up and uh, play the, it's a snippet, just, just 40, uh, um, 47 seconds. But yeah, you know, I don't want to risk uh, a, a copyright strike, so I will put uh, the link in the description box. And he actually called for turning Gaza into a parking lot. So that would mean, um, yeah, at the very least expulsion or genocide. Yeah. Because if it's a parking lot, then nobody can um, live there. That is for yeah, sure. Nothing lives there. Yeah. Yeah. So, then he proceeded to say and then blow up the dome of the rock and we will build the uh, third temple and then we will usher in the second coming and there yeah. i i really have a problem there gary because i get it people are excited about the prophecy i get it but if there is a plan then there is a plan. And I do not believe that anything that we can do here can delay or hasten the plan. What say you? Yeah, it, there's an ordained time. Yeah. And whether or not you're polytheist and you want to bring in the globalist occupation and <laughs> all and, and bring on the end time, they are no more in control of it as what a you know, a Jewish person would be if they want to start getting the, the bulls ready and all the different garments and stuff, um, nor Christians. And, and nor should we be manipulating scripture in a way that has an agenda, particularly if you are, and emphatically, if you are in any way um, suggesting a genocide of any sort. Uh, it's yeah. just... It's just not, um, it's not scriptural. It is just not what is uh, the church is asked to do. And so there, there was a period of time in prehistory where there were wars um, amongst Israel and the other states. Uh, that was a different period. And because Israel did not keep the covenant, they have been punished. They will be reconciled in the end time. But again, it's not on their timetable. It's on God's timetable. And there is a specific generation, but you can't speed it up. And there are there is a specific chronology of events that one of the things that really concerns me about Christians is, is how they ignore the chronology they've been provided by Jesus and then try and reinvent everything he says, manipulate what they say, and ignore what he says, and try and come up with all sorts of reimagined ways of understanding end time prophecy. So I, I fully disagree with that. And I know in the church we want to be respectful. But the problem is, is if as a Christian you you are superseding the chronology that we've been provided and you get it wrong, you lose your credibility. So we don't do anybody any good by getting out there saying extremist things, doing extremist things. We need to be role modeling, modeling and trying to sort of accurately sort of describe where we are. And I think we are in the fig tree generation, but there's a lot of things that have to happen before you can get into the millennium. And we don't have control over that time frame and anything that you're doing to try and do that is antithetical to what's written in scripture so i i i you know i rebuke that i just i just don't want I, I mean i disagree in the fullest of ways and i understand people can interpret things the way that they want i just don't think that that's how the bible works and uh 
So we should be we should be very aghast what happened with Israel. That is absolutely unforgivable. Uh, and they're sworn to wipe Israel from the earth, Hamas is, which is part of the ancient oath to do that. When the people of the Palestinians, ancient Philistines, were part of that oath, as Psalms 83 talks about. So our tear, which is also sort of perhaps connected to the Hezbollah bloodline, or at least spirit spiritual nature to their blood oath and there's many nations around israel so i would encourage people to read psalms 83 that's that trans generational oath to wipe israel from the face of the earth that emanates from violating the holy covenant they're not going to be wiped from the face of the earth but they're going to they're part of that consequences for violating it but they will also be saved in the last three and a half years so we can't write them off as an obsolete people that will never be brought back into the covenant. And that's what book three that, that I'm writing is about. So I would also say that Israel, and I don't think it is their intent to wipe Hamas from the face of the earth in terms of all of the Palestinians. But what I would say to Palestinians, you need to throw off that type of, of constitutional oath that Hamas has to not accept peace um israel is not occupying the gaza strip they left in 2006 <laughs> haven't returned there's been skirmishes you can have a country and part of the world order anytime that you want and you can negotiate that and i would suggest that you do that uh, whether it's exactly where you want it to be it has to be better than perpetual war and so again that doesn't mean israel can wipe the Palestinians from the face of the earth. I think they have full permission to ensure Hamas is out, although you never really destroy that ideology, as we see it just keeps popping up in all sorts of different formats. But at some point in time, the Palestinians have to take accountability on themselves to say, we control what we do. Mm -hmm. And you can't after negotiating a peace like you did three times before, walk away, you have to become part of civilized society. And what that means is a sort of a rules-based society, not that I'm trying to promote the rules-based globalist order that the Europeans yeah. like to talk about or or uh, people like Obama or Biden like to talk about. And But there has to be a way of getting along in this world. Otherwise, we are going to destroy ourselves from the face of the earth. And that's just unacceptable. And thinking that you can impose a supremacist ideology on anybody is the ultimate supremacist that is far more evil beyond white supremacy or black supremacy or whatever supremacy that people are promoting. It's just, just not acceptable. And that means just as the Roman church tried to do to impose its view on people, just as Islam is trying to do impose its view, like all the fascist tyrannical organizations throughout history try and do, you can't do that. Christianity is a choice. You have to choose to become Christians, and you can choose not to. And we are led to try and be role models to encourage people to become Christians, but we can't force it on them. Nobody can. And so things are going to play out the way they're going to play out, and Christians should stay in our lanes, <laughs> and we should counsel and role model. That's it. Yeah. That's what we're here to do. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm so happy that you said that because I saw this video and I thought I have to ask Gary about this because this yeah. doesn't feel right in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Because, you know, and, and the audience is totally over the moon. And I thought, are you even listening what he is saying? That, yeah. it, that doesn't the penny drop? And um, I thought, my goodness, all of you, you are all expecting to be saved and you are calling yeah. for genocide what's wrong with you what, yeah it's it's totally antithetical to what's written in 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 the bible and and what our instructions are the trouble is that christians tend to try and leave 
the interpretation, the understanding, the knowledge of the Bible up to a very select number of people who lead the churches. And those ministers and priests and teachers, they do not teach prehistory and they do not teach prophecy. They have, they are not teaching you the full context to what the Bible is talking about. And just as if you are, as this individual is, is, is trying to teach prophecy, then he's living out the values of the Bible. You put everything around what Jesus said in the Bible, not vice versa, and things fall into place, and you won't be trying to help Jesus bring on something. He's Alpha Omega from a Christian perspective, as God is. <laughs> we can't help him. We can only ask to be part of what can we do do to help encourage people to turn to you but there's a book of life and everybody has an opportunity to have their names left in the book of life or be blotted out that's the free choice that we're all here to make and for people who are not christians i encourage you to only try and learn understand why you believe what you believe give the christian bible um a look the whole bible old and new testament um, and decide for yourself hmm. and understand but that no decision is still a decision. Yeah. But can you understand if people see that, that they feel appalled? And... Yeah, they, should, they ought to. It should just be totally foreign to your whole spirituality and, 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 and resonatra. I mean, it's just, we're not here for revenge. Yeah. We're here to try and save ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully a few other people with us that we can sort of, you know, communicate to that, that you know, they'll make a choice for salvation as well. But I, we have to understand that the whole world's not going to believe in Christianity. Hmm. Hmm. You, you can never get 100%. You just cannot. So is there a time in the future where Jesus is going to reign from a biblical prophetic? Yeah, you will. And it'll be a time where, you know, the world has almost destroyed itself and he comes back to stop that. And that it's going to be completely sort of as a, a comparative to, let's say, the 6,000 years or more before on that reign. And people are going to see how it ought to be. But what's interesting at that for humans versus the fallen angels is that just as the angels rebelled and they knew God intimately and humans need to choose God and Jesus by faith, at the end of the millennium when Satan is released, humans rebel again. We are no better than the fallen angels and that millennium is set not only as a comparative to the history before, but to humble humans that we're no better than the fallen ones. In fact, um, you could probably make a, a good argument who does ho more horrible things, <laughs> angels <laughs> or humans on the fallen side. So you are what you what you do and what you say. And so, and it's more what you do than what you say, but they should be in harmony if you are doing yeah. what you believe, so. Yeah, exactly. So now, Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I tried to figure out if I could find something uh, that says George Lucas is part of a secret society or whatever. And uh, I couldn't find anything that verifies it very clearly. There is not a lot out there, but uh, what I found, there are a lot of fan sites. Uh, about Star Wars, of course. And um, people are saying that he fashioned the Jedi after the Knights Templar. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes, I would definitely agree with that as part of the allegory. There's there's a few layers in there on that. Um, so he's, yeah, it's defined whether or not he is a secret society member that information doesn't seem to be there uh, that's not uncommon though in hollywood where the knowledge is provided 
by the secret societies, the Rosicrucians in particular, to provide that knowledge for skilled writers and directors and producers to put out their uh, belief system and history and in all sorts of genres, whether it's horror movies, whether or not it is in ancient history, or it's in science fiction. So it's not unusual that that information is being provided and that they do get some learning uh, at a lower level, uh, but they're looking for skilled people to be able to do this and then have a promise to, for future generations, if they're not of the bloodlines, to intermarry, have their children intermarry and have a, a larger position down the road. So the question was, is were they based on the Knights Templar? And certainly um, in part that they were. So, you know, the Jedi monks are are, are warrior monks. Templars are warrior monks. Uh, Templars were at the adept level polytheists, and they had mm -hmm. a superficial camouflage. For, and for all the people who were part of the Templar order that weren't adepts uh, or grandmasters, uh, they didn't. They were, you know, as long as you believed in God or a God, just like Freemasonry, you can be part of that organization. It's just at the adept level do you become priests and wizards. And that just as those individuals are uh, adepts, they are bloodlines. They are royal bloodlines. So if you look at the founders of the Knights Templar, for example, you have Anjou, uh, who is an unlisted member, but like the St. Clairs, the St. Clairs, they are part of the creation of them. And the Anjou actually... Um, will produce the bloodlines for uh, the King of Jerusalem title. If De Boulian would be of that bloodline. Baldwin I with the official crowning in 1118 would be the official King of Jerusalem title from the Sion or grafted in Benjamite bloodline because Joshua awarded Jerusalem to Benjamite. And so the movie The Kingdom of Heaven that Hollywood put out will give you a lot of that bloodlines and allegories. But they are also royal bloodlines. And so you have the Anjou of the creation of the Knights Templar, de Boulian and de Payan as familial descendants from Dagobert of the Merovingian bloodline. And of course, they take their bloodlines back to giants and also to King David as well. And so they have a lot of scioned in. And this specific bloodline is as a connection back to the gods, to the godfathers. So these genealogies go back in Templar bloodline, back to Nephilim or Raphaim patriarchs, and also a specific fallen angel, as with all royals. And they keep the genealogies to do this. So what you see also talked about in the Jedi Nets is this, um, the that the, the bloodlines carry midi chlorions in their mm. blood cells. Uh, so like an RH negative or like a gene, however you want to allegorize that or both, just as there's the LB gens, the Julia gens, the Elvin gens, all sorts of gens of these um, genealogical trees that they set up to track that. And that um, this permits them the ability in with those midi chlorions to have have contact with these universal invisible forces, uh, the dark force or the good force, and uh, so in poly polytheism, this would also be understood as a spark of the divine, where you could have that sort of contact, and you could have intercontact with each other, like a telepathy in the visible ones. And so this is the standard sort of uh, gene of ISIS ideology that creates the high mind and the ability to communicate with spirit guides or demons or fallen angels or the white uh, brotherhood, whatever you want to call these are known by, by different things. And so the adepts at a Rosicrucian level, at a bloodline level, just as the Templars were, they could communicate with the invisible ones and create additional wisdom or power based on how 
pure their bloodlines were and what their adept and in, in, in position would be. So this is, to me, a, a complete sort of allegory of that. But it's also an allegory that goes even further. So if you look at Jedi, there's also an English transliterated word that is DJED, DJED, <laughs> DJ, E-D-I. So it would be a Jedi as well, just with sort of a, a D hardening that J sound just a little bit, which was a Magi of the uh, Egyptian polytheist religion. And mm -hmm. so they're wizards and a priest order. So you have that part. And when you look at the Jedi order, I mean, this is a council of priests, but warrior priests. And it's it's kind of like the round table of knights as well in King Arthur. Those were all kings. They just weren't knights. They were all bloodlines. And it's the round table that's trying to bring in this whole new order or balance the order in the world. And it's rooted in the ring lords of Sumeria and giants. And again, in those allegories of King Arthur, they're reflecting similar kind of things. And so you also have in the Quran. And it's spelt similarly in some transliterations as D-J-I-N, or the other direct one is J-I-N-N, which is Jinn or Dijin. And there's two groups, two classes of the Jinn in the Quran, and two levels. And these are either demonic spirits or, or fallen angels, and noting Iblis, the Quran spelling for Satan as the title um is also considered a jinn so again mm -hmm. he's obviously an angel but there's also evil demonic spirits that sort of reflected in the genies which is jinn is the et etymological root for genie as we understand like in the uh you know the alibaba and the 40 thieves and whatever else all those those arabic uh you know fairy tales so to speak and, and was, it, was it genie um I dream in of genie. With or not. <laughs> yeah, I dream of genie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when exactly. I was growing up. Yeah, absolutely. And so Yoda and Obi Wan are, you know, they appear as these demonic spirits um, after they're dead. And that's part of that ideology of the disembodied spirits of these bloodline and ancient priest kings, as they were understood. Fisher kings is another allegory for the same thing that was the unif unification of government and religion under a demigod as a king of that empire right so it's and so these disembodied spirits are coming back like demons and they're counseling and the other thing that's kind of interesting is is uh whether it's obi-wan or or yoda they're kind of like that spirit of the centaurs that were the uh teachers and mentors of the giants in greek mythology curion was was the name who taught all of the giants all of this wisdom so yeah that's just just sort of a start into it and we understand that these bodiless spirits are like shays or daemons um raphaim rafa means spirit uh, as in gilgal raphaim it could be wheel of the giants could be wheel of the spirits uh, so all of this is sort of in there in this in this order of monks uh, set in a Eastern setting of warrior monks or priest kings and with this bloodline. So the Brahmins in the Hindu religion, the priests are a bloodline priest when the civilization from the gods, just as the kings, the Raja kings are bloodlines. It's the same ideology, and this is just showing the Eastern companion ancient history that's allegorized into the same um, belief system. So, yes, it was based on the Knights Templar, but goes deeper than that. And the Templars based their organizational structure on the assassins in Sufi, you know, the poly polytheist mystical portion of Islam. And they worked with the Sufis uh, uh, for the longest period of time and uh, because they were a kin relationship in terms of the religion and the bloodline orders. Mm.
Have you ever seen the movie Assassin's Creed? I have. <laughs> what 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 do you make of the that story that the assassins are actually yeah the enemies of uh, the Knights Templar? Well, they they obviously split, but mm -hmm. they also worked together and there was <laughs> a high degree of respect. So they may be a little bit as rivals in terms of power. But they're on the same agenda, and one is not good, and one is not evil. They're they work they're working the same agenda, whether or not you think that's good or evil. So, in a little bit like our politicians, left right yes. doesn't really yeah. matter. Yeah, the uniparty is people like to call them in North America, where you have the uh, established in the U.S. I'll use that as the best example: the establishment of the Republicans on their globalist and social policies aren't really any different than the Democrats. So you get perpetual war, you get globalism, you're, they're anti-Christian. I mean, just, it's all the one uh, foreign policy. It's just one might be pushing a little more this way or a little bit more that way just to say, hey, we're a little bit more right or a little bit more left, but they're not. Uh, and uh, they don't care who wins as long as one of the two chosen on each of those establishment parties wins. So that's why populism is such a threat to the establishment parties, because they don't have an ability to control that. But after a while, even with the populist party, you would have them in, infiltrating and trying to get control again. So it would only be temporary, but I still believe we should go for populism over the establishment, but just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So there is one uh, scene in uh, one of the movies, I, I forgot the title now, but um, Anakin, Anakin, Anakin Skywalker yeah. is standing in a circle with Obi-Wan Kenobi and that circle that, that and they are in front of the Jedi Council and yeah. that circle, I think resembles a lot what people draw if they are trying to summon demons or spirits or whatever. Oh sure it is yeah they're trying to create between uh, the <clears throat> the geometry and the symmetry and the location and whatever rocks they might put in there and the rituals create a portal. Yeah. So that they can be in communication or receive knowledge or, or whatever. So yeah, it's a, a typical ritual and that um, this would be done by adepts because they would be the ones who would have that knowledge to be able to do it and that belief system. They believe that you can take that force in with you, that demonic force, and it will give you more power, which is exactly what they're trying to do with the force. They're trying to have that force as part of them. So they're one with the universe, which is again, typical polytheism. And that requires that ability to uh, communicate and be in direct contact with this nebulous world universal life force um, and that they'll be rewarded for doing so. Typically, it's not a symbiotic relationship <laughs> and it's just another demon coming in and it's a, it, whatever power of that demon has is is going to add whatever additional power that... So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a symbiotic sort of... Uh, possession i guess is and i suppose in in the adepts maybe you can control the demons to a certain degree if you have certain words rituals things like that certainly in their belief system that would be possible and you know obi-wan kenobi is an interesting sort of source to the word i don't, I don't know what you were whether or not you're leading into that or not but you know obi-wan it's based on these priest warriors not only of hinduism the templars but probably more closely related to the Tengu warriors in Southeast Asia, who are both priests and warriors as well. And these are sort of bird-like um, warriors. But that word, uh, when you look at Ben, that means sun in Hebrew, 
uh, and indicating, again, some sort of bloodline, um, which was the typical way you would use sun, whether it's Anderson or however you want to use it. There's lots of different words in the languages to, to show you in the name that you're the son of somebody. And uh, OB also derives from OBE or OWB in uh, Hebrew, which means a mumbler or a necromancer as part of that sort of mystical start. And the Zamzazim were also, as giants, identified as mumblers and people of, of, of the earth and necromancers as well. And that, that word uh, Obi uh, in Sumerian, and, and, and again, I just don't make these connections because they're interesting. In the layers of the allegory in the occult, they have so many layers. You could never think of all the different meanings and the connections. So they're all kind of likely. So if you look at the word Gilgamesh, giant of Uruk, um, son of King Lugalbanda and the mother goddess Nin, after the flood, uh, a dark haired giant. Uh, you see some translations coming out of some of the Mesopotamian language where it's not spelt as a G and, and pronounced as a G. It's a B, as in Bilgamesh. Mm -hmm. Or Bilbamesh is, is another transliteration I've seen on that. I cover a couple of those things in, in, the, in the new book. Well, if you look at OWB, the root word for King Og is OWG. And so if you're playing that letter transliteration game, that would be OWB. And he could be like Og as part of the allegory, who was a priest king of Raphaim. And he was the king of Ug Arit, Og the terrible one of the Ugaritic text where the Raphaim are created by the Baalim and he later he moves after in Genesis 14 where the giant war happens and most of the Raphaim are going to wipe out he becomes the king of Edrai and Ashtaroth in the Bashan Mount Hermon region and continues on as the last of the Raphaim after the flood so again some interesting sort of connections there with with the giants and the warriors and the priests. I mean, and, and again, they were the typical priest kings with the unification of the government and divine representatives of the Baalim. Ken in Kenobi, Obi-Wan Kenobi, um, in front of OB, you have also means knowledge and understanding and, and in Japanese means good. So lots of things that are with, in there and if you sort of translate that put all of that sort of together you kind of get you know the son of a good knowledgeable wizard priest warrior <laughs> bloodline uh obi-wan kenobi and he's pale white and <laughs> is he's generally depicted uh and i know about pale white skin because i am as about as pale white as you can get um and he's very much akin to the merlin figure as well in um Knights of the Round Table and King Arthur. And again, he's of a bloodline of the Druidic bloodline priests in that sort of understanding and a wizard, right? So he's like the Atlantean wizards. And just as you have an allegory that's woven into the Knights of the Round Table, that is the old Atlantean ruling council and their religion of wizards that were part of that hierarchy. It's the same sort of allegory that's being woven into uh, the Jedi here with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I found uh, somebody else. He um, dug up the following um, connection as well. I'm not saying yours are wrong. I'm just adding something to yeah. it. And uh, Obi is um, in Nigeria, I guess. What What is the language called? Im Ibogo, Imbo I forgot that. Anyway, it's being uh, talked in Eastern and the Southern part of Nigeria. And that word means heart, Obi. So, and um, the van, he uh, tracked that down to diminishing, so diminishing heart. Interesting. I, I, 
I, I thought, yeah, and, and you know, then adding everything to that that you just uh, uh, explained. Yeah, I don't see him as this uh, wonderful character either. And, um, but also Anakin, that is a dead giveaway. It, it's a nod yeah. to Anakim, yeah, the the giant race. Yeah, or the, in in the Anak, the Anugi, as they're called in Sumerian, and these are these are giants. And Anakim is, um, excuse me, he's he is, it you know the. Uh, Yeah, you know, Skywalker is, is the word I was looking for there. Uh, Anakim Skywalker, which now also, you know, the stars, the gods, it's a Star Wars, Angelic Wars, Visible Wars, Invisible Ones, all has that sort of uh, connection. So, yeah, Anakim is without a doubt um, one of the dark giants as an allegory as you have that coming out of, out of prehistory, just as they have good giants in prehistory. It's like the white hats and the dark hats, as people might know them uh, today as, as, when they're talking about secret societies. You had, uh, you know, white witches and evil witches. Uh, you had uh, black magic and white magic. It's the typical sort of dualism. They're all working towards the same goal. They mm -hmm. just, some may have, humankind's interest a, a little bit more at heart as with the white hats as people like to say but they're still trying to do the same thing so ultimately it's going to be the uh, the, the the same issue and luke his son i mean he's luke skywalker as well right and if you look where that comes from that comes right out of norse mythology as uh, loki the sky traveler uh, and loki was a cunning trickster and he had a changeling capability <laughs> Uh, as mm -hmm. it goes along with that shapeshifter capability, that trickster spirit is part of that bringing in of that trickster spirit. There's there's demonic trickster spirits, and then there's fallen angels or gods that have a trickster spirit. So they provide different levels of powers that would sort of go with it. So, and Loki is a giant son of of, of another giant. Farbuti, if I've pronounced that right, uh, was adopted by the chief god Odin. And Odin is the bloodline of Rolo and the bloodline of the St. Clairs and the St. Clairs. Of, we go back into the Knights Templar as one of the unnamed founders. And the St. Clairs are the descendants who create Freemasonry after the fall of the Knights Templar in England. So just to make a few more connections in there with Anakim Skywalker and Luke Skywalker, I mean, but that understanding of Skywalker, that is definitely a, an alien sort of uh, allegory or that uh, you can also understand the gods. Uh, and this would be a reference to the godfathers and the bloodline of the original patriarchal uh, fallen angel would be of the sky or a star or fallen angel of of the universe as they're described i always thought that luke skywalker has a connection to v uh, venus <laughs> and yeah well if it was a connection to venus then that would be like a connection to satan in in the occult right mm -hmm. uh, or as azel <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, or, or somebody like that, you know, as a morning or an evening star. So, um, and part of the seven wandering stars, uh, yeah. part of the seven gods that are represented. So, yeah, I never thought of that. Um, but I'm sure, Luke, again, as I say, Luke. there's so many. What's that? Luke looks light. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I th th that that was just my gut feeling. Yeah, yeah. I always yeah. thought there was some connection to Venus. Well, and so and you wonder whether or not they, they you know, you, Luke's been in there, and this is just speculation on my part because you have Lu, which is the start of Lucifer, and mm -hmm. that connects you back to Venus as well, right? So, or the morning star. Yeah. So, what would you tell people if they say, "Well, actually, Star Wars." is a story that is letting you know 
that even spiritual people can be warriors. Can be warriors? Oh, yes. Well, that's definitely the understanding in polytheism. Mm -hmm. um, and you could also maybe make that connection with some of the prophets in the Old Testament. Um, you know, like Samuel, he actually kills uh, King Agag because Saul didn't do what he was told to do. So certainly not in a sort of a same strong fashion as what's on the mystical side of the religions. Um, but yeah, they can be warrior kings. And, and and that's where that whole Fisher King, Priest King understanding sort of comes from and of the bloodline. So yeah, you would have, you know, um, uh, in, you know, in that religion and what's interesting is, and I'll just for sort of link in the book of Enoch to a certain degree on this is, is Azazel is the one who taught Warcraft, the making of weapons, the tactics of war, martial arts, the whole sort of kit and caboodle of, of war and, and, and violence, uh, to, uh, not only the giants who are ruling, but also the warriors and also to the priests. So you see that coming down in that Tengu tradition that we talked about in Japan and in Southeast Asia. And also in that tradition, they were taught the martial arts from the gods. And mm -hmm. that you also have these monk warrior religious orders in China as well you know, with Kung Fu and all the different sort of martial arts. So there's a long tradition of that. Um, I, you know, I struggle with that sort of aspect that if you are spiritual, why you would be that violent, no matter of what religion you would be in. I get it if you're following the orders of your God or of your gods, but it just seems to be if you're after a better world, after a better uh, outcome you wouldn't try and do that with violence um unless you were actually a god uh, and mm -hmm. perfect in all of your ways and things have been done in a way that uh it's been completely over millennia attested to that this way is wrong mm -hmm. but wouldn't you say that in general the Jedi try to use the Force to become themselves living God. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because they are like a ruling class, right? Over mm -hmm. top of everybody. They have more powers. Yeah. And if they had absolute power, um, that would probably be abused. So, yeah, it's it's there. It's 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 that classification from all of the mundane humans that are in Star Wars that these this is a demigod group who only wants people to rule over and tell them what to do and to let them do what they want to do. So that's why it's important to understand that they also bring in some of the royal bloodlines that work in harmony with that, because again, that's that hierarchical ancient order where you have the kings and the queens that are bloodlines and the warrior priest class or the priests that are uh, of 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 the same kind of bloodline so again with the tangu or the brahmins where the bloodlines come from the same gods just for specific roles within ruling over the mundane humans mm. yeah. so same agenda maybe a little bit nicer to humans but not much <laughs> <laughs> Are there certain degrees of misery? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I would not want to learn all of them, but I, I presume there is. <laughs> so with Anakin, um, the other interesting thing is, of course, he turned into Darth Vader. Yes. And the word Darth, do you think that is a nod towards Kabbalah, where you have in the so-called tree of life, yeah. the da ah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yep. Yeah. And and anything, you, you know, there again, there's a dualism in mysticism. There's dark and there's light. 
and this is one of the dark lords as well um but uh, and again within that belief system it would be i mean they're still working towards the same goals and everything but they have different rituals different ways of doing things and um so yeah he is the dark or the father lord i mean you could translate that either way um and i think in kabbalism um you know they show some of that uh, uh dark side in kabbalism you know from uh how they try and look into the future is part of that sort of dark side of 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 kabbalism so yeah i think there's a connection there yeah Hmm. Yeah, there is um, a interesting uh, video on YouTube where somebody goes deep into the so-called uh, tree of life and explains that it's actually a tree of death. It, it's quite interesting, but yeah. you need to focus for a while yes. yeah, because, yeah. because the, the, the entire thing cannot work. They are yeah. missing links, gears, and yeah. what happened, <laughs> and he rips it all apart, and yeah. uh, it, it's really quite interesting. And especially, let's say, in the new age, um, yeah, people are over the moon with the tree of life, but yeah. um, it's actually the opposite. Yeah, I, you know, I think you know when you look at the tree of life, uh, it has a lot of meanings in polytheism. Um, you know, you have, uh, and it's another tree away, let's say, from their uh, genealogical tree or their uh, thalamic tree uh, for their organizational structure. Uh, but the tree of life is based on the ideology as they take stuff that's also in monotheism. You have a tree of life in the Garden of Eden, tree of life that Adam and Eve had access to until they broke the only law that they were provided and were ostracized. And so they learned more knowledge, but then they lost the access to the tree of life. You have the tree of life that shows up with the Anunnaki and uh, their spurious offspring. And it's almost like a technology. You know, they've got like a pine cone or a crystal, whatever you want to call it. And they also have this purse, almost like a bag of technology. They're doing rituals around these things. And I think there's something to that tree of life as we sort of look at the different views and what people say about it, that they are offering a possibility with angelic technology, the ability to have um, long lives or um, immortality in the physical world. And what that is, is to be able to, but typically that would only go for one of the bloodlines because it's their counterfeit spirits that don't sleep or human spirits sleep and it goes back to heaven. But for the bloodlines, they need to have what they call an oikotarian or the what you would get out of the Bible is an oikotarian, a dwelling place for the spirit. So biblically in Jude 1, 6, you have those fallen angels who left their habitation or their house in heaven, as it's also known in the original Greek as Oikotarian in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, that means a dwelling place for the spirit. So there's mm -hmm. a dwelling place for the spirit, for the spirit beings in heaven, but in the physical world, which is a physical world versus a spiritual dimension, you need to interact physically, you need a dwelling place, which is typically a soul on a body. As the Bible tells you, there's a spirit that merges with the soul and the body, and the soul and body is of this world. So it's that soul and body for the eternal, immortal spirit of the Raphaim and the Nephilim that they need to be able to continue to regenerate or create clones or whatever so that you have a body where these demonic spirits can continue to live forever. So I think that's what they're promising and... Uh, for all the people of the bloodlines, and they just don't tell humans, this is not going to work for you, but we need you as our useful idiots below to give us cover and everything else and to do things for us, fight our wars and stuff like that. Um, and that that tree of life is going to become more real as a real offering as we get closer to the end time. 
because if you're going to create the end time, if you're going to create a logical position that uh, you can take on the evil lord of the universe, which is the dark force in the Star Wars analogy, then you're going to have to have the technology to be able to take those forces on and, and to be able to win. And that the promise for joining that rebellion against the dark ones that they call the people of the Bible and, and the Christian God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and their loyal angels, that whole group as the dark ones, as they would call them, if you're going to take them on, then as a reward, we'll offer you immortality in the physical world because they can't offer immortality in the spiritual world. So they have to be able to create some sort of physical immortality for that promise that they're going to provide but it will only be for the bloodlines and in this case the ones with the midi chlorines in their cells permitting them to be in continual um sort of uh contact or adjoining with the universal life force so that's going to be offered in the end time and that has to come with unlimited knowledge as well so that's going to take ai and quantum computing and the divine essence from another dimension where all the knowledge is transmitted through quantum entanglement and you're going to need to make that contact just as astral planing is trying to do that in the same sort of way to make contact this would be a permanent contact through that chip system that i think that they're trying to develop with all the different technologies that is part of the whole beast system from the end time from a christian perspective mm -hmm. yeah um, do you have any thoughts on the second part of the name, uh, Darth Vader? What struck me was, uh, in German, if you exchange the D for a T, you have the word Vater, and Vater means father. Yeah, yeah, I think it's definitely comes from the Germanic or the Norse sort of tradition. And that's why, you know, we talked earlier, I said that I probably should have, uh, you know, elaborate on it. You could, I would translate that as dark father or dark Lord. Um, and, but, you know, in the religious sort of connotation, father is in Lord as in God is sort of uh, a known trend, uh, um, a known way of saying God without saying God, right? Using Lord. So Lord God is is Jehovah Elohim. Um, and if it's just uh, Lord, it's Jehovah. And 427 times where it's legitimately coming from Adon or Adon, it means my Lord, as opposed to substituting that. And what's also interesting is Baal, father of the Raphaim that I made references to with the uh, Gilgal Raphaim, the Ugaritic text, the post diluvian giants, that means Lord God. A, e, and A-L is a transliteration of E-L, just as I-L-U is in several other ones. So that, again, is part of that whole understanding of Dark Lord, um, or at least the Lord part, would be, um, you know, a dark God, right? Or one of the, of the evil ones. So, and of course, biblically, you could also say, okay, if you want to complete that sort of allegorical trans uh trans transliteration uh it would be the evil god of the bible that um they're talking call it calling the dark lord just as the dark lord and dr strange is the evil one of the universe and the ones with the similar religion as in star wars they're trying to win the earth as uh, a realm on their own through a treaty through the war where they don't have to be under the rules of this dark evil lord of the universe and his followers Mm -hmm. same um, allegories so in preparation for this uh, interview I watched all Star Wars movies <laughs> which I actually did not enjoy that's a that's, lot at one time <laughs> yeah no, not not. I took the entire month of November to do that so ah. um, that first of all that it's fresh and um yeah but but uh, one per day is enough and then i <laughs> okay so anyway and i looked out for hints that um 
yeah, the so-called dark side is actually the light side. But I have to say, I couldn't find any. It is really, really hard to like the dark side in these. It movies. is the way it's portrayed. You know yes. Yeah. 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 Because they look at the dark side in the macro dualism versus within the religion that the God of the Bible is evil and everybody who follows them are evil and that they are the children of light. So just as Christians depict the dark side as the rebellious angels, their spirits offspring, polytheist religions as totally evil. It's this, it's, it's this absolute inverse of each other. And so, um, and again, Christians calls, we call ourselves the children of light. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's why I encourage people to learn as much as they can and make your decision. And we won't know likely uh, in our lifetime, whether or not we chose correctly or not, but that choice is going to be important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what's up with the death? I mean, um, I cannot imagine a, a the true creator just willy nilly, um, you know, shooting up entire planets. That that well, is, yeah. So what they what where they kind of get there in in my understanding and my speculation is is that in the end time biblically you see this destruction right mm -hmm. um and then but it stopped but then at the end of the millennium then he destroys the heaven and earth and creates a new one um but you have the same sort of understanding or similar understanding on the polytheist side so with shiva as a destroyer god probably equivalent to azazel a bad napoleon and that understanding is you have to destroy the old world so the new world rises out like a phoenix right so one of the problems when you get into some of the hollywood movies and it's not written by adepts mm -hmm. they fit names and 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 ideas in that may not totally fit consistent with what they believe uh because it's not adept literature. They're receiving knowledge and they're just working in sort of ideas and you're not sure which side that fits on or how that fits or, or why that's even in there that they would need a planet destroyer. Um, some people think that uh, Wormwood is a planet destroyer in the Bible, except that it doesn't destroy the earth, only 25% destruction, but awful nonetheless, if it was a planet or a star. And it is classified as a star um, in, in, in the book of Revelation. So some people look at the flood was caused by three stars of the Pleiades, Mm -hmm. or by some sort of asteroids coming down or meteors that were large enough to do that. So there is this, on both sides, there's this understanding that stars have the ability, whether or not they're actually a, a real star, a created weapon, or an asteroid used as a weapon uh, that actually causes that sort of destruction. So, yeah, it doesn't really sort of fit that um, you would destroy everything in in you know in in the multiple planets because ideally that's what they're trying to do now mm -hmm. would that mean that they would leave in that meaning one planet that wouldn't be destroyed perhaps and maybe again that sort of that inverse sort of allegory that that's the realm both sides are trying to win just one planet where you can i don't it just to me you're absolutely bang on it's uh i've wrestled with that allegory many times and you just sort of churn over it but i'm not an adept and, and i'm sure the adepts approved it and they would understand the application and the meaning i'm not so sure lucas uh, would have understood it or uh, any of the other writers but uh, it certainly has a high level meaning for sure yeah and circling back uh once again to darth vader <laughs> <laughs> uh, he has this breastplate. Yeah. 
and on it are Hebrew letters. Oh, I never noticed the Hebrew letters. Yeah. This was the public hour for full access of the entire interview. Please join our Patreon community. Thank you.